Can anyone see this document? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, tonight uh, we're going to do a crosswalk between the survey responses and the forum data. I'm hoping that you all have some observations that you extracted from the survey once we were finally able to uh, make that uh, viable for everyone. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit uh, the policy governance board role and the superintendent CEO role. I've done some color coding uh, that I think will help uh, do some clarification and also some prioritization. We'll talk a little bit about the Agency of Education COVID plan and the connection to the strategic plan. Uh, I sent you the graphic timeline and the strand or theme icons to look at. And I think we're going to need one more design team meeting uh, in early May. And then maybe this is a good time just to uh, explore some dates. Uh, I'd like to do it before the 10th of May. So let me, let me go to next week. And, and I've got open, well, Wednesday, I guess I've got open. Or, you know, it's 5.30. It could be, could be a little bit later on Thursday. Or we can look at the, oh, the 10th is that Monday. Uh, so it's looking like Wednesday would be, oh, let me just think about this. I'm in North Carolina and I've got to arrive and I am camping right here. So let me just think. Well, we may not be able to do that. Let's, let's see how we do tonight. And if we need to, um, we'll schedule it after the board meeting and uh, do some adaptations based on what the board feedback is. Yeah, I forgot that uh, I'm now uh, fully vaccinated uh, from COVID. Doesn't mean I won't get it, but I have three little granddaughters in North Carolina that have uh, been itching to see uh, Mimi and Pa, and we've been itching to see them. So we're looking on to the camper tomorrow. We're headed, uh, headed south on Monday for a month. So any communication we have in May, it's going to be uh, Goodrich on the road. And that's the beauty of technology. All right. Well, that's the agenda. Uh, let, us, let us start the conversation with what, what your observations have been. And I'm just going to list these uh, from reviewing the survey before I, before I fully go there. Were you all able to, once I figured out the magic of shutting the survey down, then you could see all the graphs. With a thumbs up, could you all see the, the bar graphs and the pie graphs? Beautiful. They were, they were much, much nicer than the spreadsheet was, so I'm glad we were able to get that done. Um, what did you see? What did you observe? Um, I'll take it question by question. And... Uh, any overall observations is, that either reinforce what we heard in the forums uh, or new things? And uh, David, would you be my, my facilitator tonight? My eyes and ears, because I can't, uh, at least my eyes, I can't see folks. I will do it with a heightened level of confidence, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, but what, did, uh, what did you all... Uh, glean from the survey. That good? Okay, so one thing that I noticed that I, and it, maybe we don't have it disaggregated far enough to note it too, but there's this group of people who are RUHS graduates who have children in the elementary school who responded to the survey. I mean, it seems like the percentage just kind of flows through those questions. And I thought, oh, that's the demographic that we're, that we're preaching to. These are people from our community who stay in our community, who have children in our schools, who actually care enough to respond to these things. And, and, and uh, I thought, and it's a, it's a high percentage of the numbers, at least it showed up in the elementary school numbers. Uh-huh, okay. Good observation. Okay, 
Any other general observations before I kind of go question by question? This is Gus. I actually found a lot of, I read through the responses that were, I thought very informative. So many people felt like they couldn't answer or rank accurately because they didn't know what things meant. Um, so I don't know what that means to the validity of the data, um, but they were pretty honest in their responses, like not knowing what PLPs are or what on earth is advisory and what does it mean and how do I rank it? And um, and the comments on senior project were literally 54, 50 against. It was really funny. Ah, <laughs> huh. 54, four? Well, just if it was 50%, it was just like six of one half, a dozen of the other type thing. like. They either loved it or hated it. There was no middle ground. Okay. Got it. Ah. Um, I did send out the uh, definition of the terms afterwards, along with the uh, the survey to the hundred and I think 140, 143 respondents. So after the fact, they were able to glean a little bit or learn a little bit more about the uh, the education jargon. Yeah, this is Jeff. I, I agree completely. There, what jumped out at me was a real—I don't know what the right word is—but publicity problem. Uh, the Innovation Center, PLP, Senior Project. Uh, people had no idea what we were talking about, and and that's not your fault in terms of creating the survey. It's a it's a problem that the district has in terms of communicating what's actually going on in, inside the school, schools. Yep. That, that can be a, a focal point for our communication uh, narrative as we move forward. Uh, so we'll certainly keep that in mind. This is Richard. Um, I, I have to say, I mean, there was, there was thankfully quite a few positive things in there, but I did see there was a almost alarming undercurrent of uh, cynicism from a lot of a lot of the responses and the narrative responses underneath. Um, I mean, some of it was obviously more extreme than others, but um, yeah, that, that just seems to be, I, I feel like we've alienated certain members of the community or parent group. And I think we need to be um, honest and, and really think about why that may have happened and how to repair it. Okay. Okay. Another theme, this is this is Lindsay, um, another theme that I saw, and this just kind of goes along with kind of what Richard was saying and sort of some of the things that popped out on the sort of negative was, and it's hard to know whether this was like one person commenting over and over again with the same thing or whether it was like more of a theme, but sort of this concept of like politics and how they play into school and where they play into school and sort of political agendas. And again, I don't know if that's like one individual or not, but I just think it's something that again was was mentioned in there that might be something we need to you know, think about in terms of how that's being presented or is there a cohesive way to present that type of stuff so people don't kind of the same thing feel alienated in, in that way. So if I said to present info without bias, that might be one way to uh, even implicit bias. Yeah, okay. Are there any other general observations? Okay, let's take uh, question by question. Uh, next stage of their lives, students need to develop uh, life, socio-emotional, executive functioning, all of that. I saw that a number of you uh, have identified uh, specific things. Does anything else come to your mind as you look at this list? Okay, let's go to question two. Uh, positive middle school culture where students feel physically, emotionally, intellectually safe. Is this large enough so you can actually read it on your screen? Yes. Okay. A any additions here or any uh, need clarification on what you see? Um, I think this comes down to the communication thing as well. I don't know if this is just a misunderstanding on the part of the people who are commenting, but 
Um, I saw a lot of people railing against the career day for girls, and I don't know that they necessarily understand what that entails and why we think it's so important. Um, and I don't know if this is just something that some people will, will never understand why we push it in particular. Um, but that did jump out from the comments that a lot of people seemed really, some people almost offended uh, by the fact that we'd have one for girls and not for boys. And um, I'm not sure how we would communicate the point that has been missed. Okay. And that's a really a good little gender. When I presented that particular offering to my sixth graders, a couple of the boys were like, wait, what about us? And I, I simply asked them, do you feel you have access to explore those tech opportunities? And they all said, yes. I said, okay, well, thank you. So this is specifically for girls just because they don't usually have that. And they all agreed, which is great. But Richard's point is how on earth do we communicate that to people? Mm -hmm. Well, or the flip side is do it for both, both, uh, both genders. Okay. Any other thoughts here? Student voice uh, was a fairly high priority. Uh, just going to underline that. And this one. Okay. Let's move on to three. Uh, current middle school operating model. And for those of you who came in a, a little bit later, uh, Jeff brought up a good point that maybe we should embed that as, a, as an action step in the strategic plan. So when we get to that point, Jeff, make sure you uh, hold me accountable here and I'll edit that in. We'll figure out what the, what the metrics will be. What do you see here that either concerns you uh, or prompts another thought? I think it's more. I think this seems like. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think, I don't, not to be redundant, but I just think there's a lot of that kind of, um, again, like sort of missed understanding of some of the things like, like why are um, the conferences important? Why are, you know, personal goal plan setting? And so, and even if it's like we're talking about is how do we better present all that information to parents so that they feel because it seems like in some of their comments, they're supportive of those things, but the numbers don't always show that. So again, I just wonder if there's, you know, communication error there for folks. Okay. Also with advisory, um, I think it was, it scored pretty high, an adult supportive advisory, but I feel like people mentioned that there's inconsistencies among the advisory programs. And so that's something, you know, some, kids have advisors who do this and other ones do that and so i think people want to see some consistency with advisory okay. that's what i was going to comment on was the yeah. advice i was surprised by the responses to how advisory is going because i mean it seems like it should be one of those things that's really positive and useful um i wonder how much of this is just you know the bias of people more willing to complain than they are to to praise but um it it does seem a little strange that um, we have that kind of that kind of response to the to how useful advisory is. I was um, I would have thought it would be a more um, useful thing that the kids could do, and it was especially surprising given, as Kelsey said, how important they rated it uh, in other areas of the survey. Yeah, I, I think it, it. One of the things that I had talked to Witten about when it came to this area was just re-examining the advisory. You know, as a as a parent who went to advisory conferences, it really was surprising how the advisor didn't know what Chase had been doing. Like they were getting the information the same time we were getting the information. And I'm like, well, he could have just told us that over dinner. You know, we didn't need to have a meeting with you if you really don't know what's going on. So I think that the advisory concept seems like an excellent idea but i think that they're different from advisor to advisor and i think even having the student-led conferences maybe lets the advisor off the hook like well i just need to be there and the student's going to run things 
Okay. All right. Thinking about that too, with the student forum, Winston, I know you were there and David too, the students really, really talk strongly about advisory. So it's definitely something that there is some real big gap between what the students are saying and what think what the adults are saying. And so um, just to kind of put it out there that I think that every student that we talk to has um, positive thoughts about advisory, but it is alarming that it's such a big difference between what the adults are maybe saying. Well, and Lisa and I got to hear the alumni and they were very positive. In fact, many of them uh, participated, I think, because they had such strong relationships with each other and with their advisor. And so those are those are our graduates that see the uh, the benefit of it. Okay. One thing yeah. I, always... I think the consistency point is really noted because um, the people, the alumni who came to that forum were people who had advisors that followed the model with fidelity and really felt passionately about advisory. Um, so I'm definitely hearing that feedback. I think there are things we can do to strengthen. Okay. Richard, do you got a, a point? Yeah, one thing I, I'd forgotten about this, this has jumped out at me and having, um, you know, placed my kids with advisors every year and thinking how good it sounds that they're going to be consistently with one teacher for their, you know, for the rest of their school career, that great relationship building. Um, one thing that this pointed out to me was the fact that, if, especially if we're going to separate the middle and high school more, um, we're going to get to a stage where we have uh, teachers who are high school teachers, but they're advising middle school students um, for a couple of years each time. And I had, I guess I hadn't really done the, the logistics in my head of if you're a high school teacher, um, but you have to advise, for, you know, um, seventh grade middle schoolers, then you've got a big disconnect with scheduling and all sorts of things. And I guess I hadn't really appreciated what a... Um, what a burden that puts on a teacher in that position. So I think it's definitely worth being open-minded to, to how we how we structure that model, because I can see how that would be um, a bit of a logistical nightmare if you were put in that position. Okay, got it. All right, ready to move on? Uh, this is a curriculum issue. Take a, take a read, let me know that prompts anything. I think in a lot of the comments, like not necessarily under curriculum, I just noticed like people pointing out the importance of academics still and the need for it to you know, be strong and to push students to feel motivated and to have high academics. And there were even some questions where I think people were questioning, like, why aren't academics more kind of front and center here? And again, as design team members, I think we have a sense of, yes, we know that's important. But like we've talked about in other scenarios, even though we think academics is a given, I think it's important that we're still, you know, really highlighting, you know, the, the basic aspects and where those strengths are in addition to the extra things they've talked about here. And a lot of people talk, like, I feel like this question could have been, like, worded, I don't know, a little differently so that it was more about how we're teaching the curriculum, not the curriculum itself, you know, because a lot of people were like, well, hands-on is important, but I, I don't know, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I just felt like um, because they kept saying academics are important we weren't saying like the questions didn't say like which one's the most important social studies science that wasn't the point of the question so i think that some of that got lost but in the comments it was it was um that part was more in, informative than the actual ranking for this one okay got it any other thoughts on, on the curriculum side Uh, what should the middle school grade configuration be? And you can you can see from the survey that it was roughly a 50-50 split. I don't remember the exact numbers. Any thoughts around 
great configuration. I don't know if you can do this, but it, I would be curious to see who was voting because it was such a split, like to see who was voting for what, you know what I mean? Like why, why it was such a big split. I don't think we can, uh, but I'll certainly look at that. Okay. Other thoughts about middle school grade configuration? Okay. Let's go to smooth transition from elementary to middle. You can see what some of the general comments are. Oh, here's the girls' career day. Okay. All right, let's go to smooth transition from middle to high school. Anything new emerge from this one? Okay, and here's that old innovation center. I did create a definition or a mission. Actually, I uh, worked with Mr. Cato around uh, identifying what the mission of the innovation center was. It seems like this is a, is a real gem. Uh, it sounds like more and more students and teachers could benefit from accessing that resource. Okay. Community expectations for students in project-based, senior project. We talked about those above. Any, any new info come to your mind here? This is Gus. I was actually really surprised to see so many comments saying that Senior Project doesn't have any value. Um, I know of several young people who, who, well, whose parents are educators who went through our high school and they felt like Senior Project was the only thing that had enough rigor to prepare them properly for college. Mm -hmm. um, clearly those people did not fill out the survey. So I just was really surprised it had, they had such poor reviews. And yeah. I'm sure that's just a reflection on some people's experience, which of course is based on the effort you put into it. Yeah. So I do think that a student's effort can you know, suggest the outcome and therefore perhaps predict the result of a survey. Well, I also uh, I gleaned from this that uh, it, it probably makes sense to build throughout the whole high school experience. Is there a sophomore experience also that has a capstone project? The, there have been um, different gate pro gateway projects over the years at various grade levels. Um, and unfortunately, as staff have come and gone, um, they haven't necessarily stood the test of time. Um, and so I think that what I got from reading all of this is that th there's really um, important data that shows us that that needs to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. well, uh, my, my understanding as a parent with kids who went through the system is that they had like it was like a hierarchy of like seventh grade they had one type of project eighth grade yeah. was a different type of project and it just built upon itself so it was so the ideally it was built up so that once they got to senior project they would be prepared for it um i don't know where that got lost and i think COVID, of course interrupted that but i do think that was a really really good plan
having been um, a student who did senior project, and then I've actually been on the panels quite a bit in the last years, I really agree with the idea of like, it's really student dependent. And I've seen students like really take it above and beyond and like put a ton of effort in and be able to carry that on. I've also been like, for me, I don't think I knew well enough that for the amount of effort I put in, I should choose something that I was going to use. Like I learned how to win her backpack, which was exciting, but I didn't, I wasn't able to really, I mean, I could carry on the knowledge of how to write a paper, but there were certain things now looking back going into a medical field that I was like, I would have loved to have been encouraged to be like, Hey, you could choose something maybe in those things. So I wonder if there's a way to like, you know, kind of help students, like you say, maybe it's building it early on or understanding like, here's what you're going to be doing and where the work goes in and here are ways you could use it to really advance you if you want to, or here's a way to learn something new that you're just interested in. But that's just some of my, my personal feedback. Okay. Got it. Anything else on a senior project? Okay. Does project-based learning build that kind of scaffold those capstone expectations? It does, but they're elective classes and therefore not every student takes them. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't sort of perfectly align with senior projects. So it builds the skills of connecting with community members. Um, it builds the skills of seeing a project through to completion. Um, but only for the students who take a PBL. Um, hmm. What do students do if they're not doing a PBL? They, they take other electives. So they might be taking an AP class or they might be taking, um, oh, you know, something in the fine arts. It, it just, got um, it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Anything else under PBL? Thank you, Gus. I love the teamwork. Uh, Randolph Tech Center program. Any thoughts here? Okay. And what, what about what, world? What was, go ahead. What was student choices to go? What, what, what did that mean? I think that means to attend, but uh, someone want to clarify? Yeah, so we've discussed that, um, I think, quite a bit. It's more around the student feeling like it's a viable option and not the only option. So the concern was that some students wouldn't see that there were enough flexible pathways for them to make a real choice and feel ownership of their decision making. Um, and, and so that's why it it really speaks to that need for the tech center to be seen as a career pathway and not sort of as something where students who, you know, aren't academic necessarily. And that's not my perception, but I think that over time that has been a perception of tech and career centers um, who attend there. Okay. All right. Entry into the world of work. Any new information emerge Winton, here. Winton, can I yeah. ask a question about that tech center one too? Yeah. It's up above it says choice about what the tech center does. What does that mean? Um, well, who, who put that in there? Also mentioned parent communication. And maybe just that parents need more information about what the tech center programs are. Oh, okay. So in helping their child decide whether or not the tech center is a good option? Like that. Yeah, I think that's it. I saw a comment that um, referred to if my student was given information to bring home, I did not see it. So I think that's a reference to how backpack delivery does not function <laughs> well in many households. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Anne. Uh, entry into the world of work. Anything new emerge there? OK. 
Okay. All right. And the final one in this segment, uh, it's all of the kind of the college ops and options around AP and dual enrollment, early college, vast. Any new information here? I do okay. remember from the comments on this one, there was a lot of talk about class choice and parents feeling like they didn't, they weren't involved in knowing what, what um, students could choose for their classes. Um, I just noticed that in the comments. Okay. Got it. Anything else? All right. Let's go to question nine, uh, the one that referenced a strong uh, student connection with at least one adult in the high school community. You can read what uh, kind of the high level observations were. Anything to add to the PLP and the language, multiple ways to connect? Okay. Uh, opportunities for student voice in the high school community. Any thoughts here? Okay. And question 11. What else do you think would be helpful to improve the quality of education? We got a pretty good list here. Take a scan and let me know. Um, do you have any additional thoughts? I do think it's, when I was reading these comments, it was concerning that there was a there's a perception in the community that if we talk about students of people of color or diversity or anything, that it's somehow promoting a political agenda. And maybe that's left to the language that's used, but I was really concerned about that. Okay. I saw some of that as well. I was a little bit shocked uh, with one of the comments about we don't need any uh, any diversity or equity or inclusion inclusion uh, training because we just don't have uh, much racial or ethnic diversity in our schools, and that that I was surprised at that. I think part of the challenge that we're facing is because we're in this community that isn't very diverse, that we are faced with a lot of families who don't really have much experience, some some of them not even outside of Vermont. Um, so while I don't agree with them necessarily, I can see where their perception has come from. And mm -hmm. unless you've been or lived in places where there is a much higher degree of diversity, then you may not you may not understand what the need for understanding it is as much of as much yeah. as we may want to push it. So I I don't agree with it, but I can see, unfortunately, it's a product of where we are is, is where it's come from. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think we there needs to be a way we can outreach and educate about that, but I don't know how we do it without people feeling that like they're being patronized. I just was at a um, conference today where I don't know if the elementary teachers have run across the same sun shines here it's mm. uh it was it, gus you, you've seen that mm -hmm. book yeah um, 
it's a great way of sort of looking at um, both. And I saw the authors spoke at this conference and they were talking about, so in the book, um, there's a rural young man from Kentucky, I think it is, uh, or Appalachia, and he's writing with a pen pal of an immigrant um, from India. Mm. And they're writing letters back and forth, and they, and they, and one of the things that the authors said in working with schools and sharing the book is that the really great learning that takes place is the students from both sort of the urban environment where you have all that diversity and the students from the rural environment. Many teachers have taken the idea and they do pen pal kinds of things, but the bottom line is that they all realize that even though there are a lot of differences, the reality is there's more in common than not. So I don't know, but anyway. There's a really great- hey, Andy, What's the name of the book? She said it was the same sun shines here. Yeah, I believe that's what it's called. There's there's a younger book for like fifth grade level by Andrew Clements that's about pen pals, a, a boy in Iowa and a girl in, I think it was the Middle East, and they were writing and the girl sent the boy a Ziploc baggie of earth. And so he added it to his Ohio farm earth. But the <laughs> fact that it was the only thing she had to share really made an impact on him emotionally. It's really, really well written. Huh? What's yeah, the name I, of that one? Uh, the name is escaping me, but the author is Andrew Clements. What What these authors pointed out is what's um, What's interesting for the for the uh, their book is that the diversity is within the United States, and there are a lot of um, things for young people to reach out to places across the country or you know, across the world, but we have this diversity within our own country and we're so siloed in terms of, and segregated in the way that we live that we don't interact a lot. Even in the urban setting, sometimes they were, you know, you have an enclave of, of Asian Americans and then you have an enclave yeah. of black Americans and Hispanics and, and one of the things they're hoping that their books and, and their work um, is that it encouraging Americans to get to know one another because we've, we've become so polarized and we live so separately. But anyway. Good idea. I'll stop. It was a great, great conversation here. Okay. Anything else in question 11? Okay, well, let me put that one away. Thank you very much. I, I hope you found that interesting uh, as you look through the survey, especially the narrative responses. All right, let's take a look at, see where we are on the agenda. Um, let, me, let me take us to the, the goal matrix and maybe I can better get at the issue here. So what I've done is uh, I've created a legend with colors just to help us kind of differentiate uh, some of the information. So you can see the board role is red, superintendents green, other roles are black. Uh, existing initiatives, and this is uh, David and Lisa, this is where I'm gonna need your help also uh, with Lane, uh, just to help me know what is a current initiative and that's in brown and new initiatives in blue. And there, there's some, uh, there's going to be some melding of that, uh, but I think it's helpful as you as you take a look at this, uh, you're seeing quite a bit of brown in this first goal. So these things are already happening. Uh, so I, I tend to just concentrate on the action step and the metric, uh, but note that uh, school board role in red is update board ends and executive limitations policies based on what emerges here from the strategic plan and then the superintendents responsible for implementing uh, those executive limitations or procedures uh, based on 
what emerges from the action step. Uh, you can see the interdisciplinary units, the lining staff professional development, and that's more role for principals. And then track student achievement increases on data assessments, and that would be teacher, teacher leaders. And I believe I'm accurate that you are either already or soon to be implementing um, professional development initiatives, uh, the uh, professional learning communities. Uh, help me to know, David and Lisa, are, are those happening now or those are slated to happen in the fall? We already have uh, our PLCs that we use um, for looking at data um, in the elementary schools. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't call it a teacher leader um, task. It's, it's actually a teacher task. You know, that okay. while we do the work together, it, it, there is, they don't fob it off on somebody else. They, they, they need to, you know, figure out what their students need and go from there. Okay. Yeah, our grade teams um, function in a similar way, and we had a plan for how they would um, use data to drive um, decision making and conversations this year, but this year has sort of been atypical. Um, so I would say that has not gone exactly according to plan, um, but we do have a structure that I think would, would support this week work pretty well. Um, Kelsey could speak to that too at the middle high school level if she felt like she wanted to add something. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have um, our new like local assessments too with STAR 360. And so through department meetings, we track data that way as well. Um, like Lisa said, it's been a little bit different this year, but I still, I feel like it's something that we can just do so easily now because we have access to it digitally that like I can look at the data anytime I want to and make decisions for my class tomorrow. So it's just very different than how it maybe used to be. Like I already can have CMIS back data, I can see STAR data. So it just, it happens in real time, I think pretty easily for, for teachers in the middle and high school. And how often do the, uh, either the PLCs or the grade teams or the uh, 360 groups, how often do they look at data? Is it once a week, once a month? Well, I mean, in terms of like actual assessment data, we look at that, we, we benchmark three times a year. So that's kind of like the more, more formal data. Um, and then as a, as a team, you know, we would do it more during integrated units probably, but. And, and I would say in the elementary schools, it's a moving target um, because our, our PLC time gets shared, you know, between lots of different subjects, as opposed to just having a, a department team being able to talk about math. So we got to share it between math and literacy, and you know, and, and other and science and other things. So um, um, I would say monthly is a safe thing to say, but not more than that right now. Okay. Okay. Anything else to add here, either that we heard in the surveys or we heard in the forums, any of the, uh, the data uh, synthesis that we've done that fall under the goal of ensuring all students have access to learning resources and materials? I just have clarification because I'm not in the school system side of things. When you guys are speaking of data, is that like individual student data or like the class as a whole data, some of both? I'm just curious. Um, I, I would say it's yes, because it gets used for not, you know, if, if you look at the class as a whole, um, that will inform your instruction for everybody as opposed to individual data as if you need to intervene with a small group. So, you, you know, you one then the other, I guess. Okay, great question. Thank you. When I, I also think about, yeah. Hold on. Go ahead. Ann? Oh, so I'm, I'm just looking at the goal. Um, ensure all students have access to learning resources and materials. And this doesn't seem like, like 
it meets what you the action steps and the metrics we're talking about looking at like data i mean are you going to keep data on access to learning material resources and materials like i mean that's not really an outcome that's do you have access to it it's not okay uh, I, I guess i'm curious how you came up with this goal well lord only knows so help me to shape it so that it meets what are well, our, what are our action steps this is the area where we're talking about kind of that foundational knowledge, no? Um, yes, but we've all got a, we've got a foundational knowledge down here. So I, I'll do some mergers and acquisitions. Here's what we said under foundational knowledge. Implement research-based instructional strategies in all classrooms. Complete detailed assessment uh, framework. I don't know where internships got in there. And then we've got vertically and horizontally aligned the curriculum. So some of these kind of bleed over into other theme areas. But I think the intent here was, as you look at school culture and climate, what should the goal statement be here? We're talking about equity, inclusion, disabilities, social emotional learning. So it isn't as much the curriculum side, which would be in foundational learning, it's more about um, the other things that either help or get in the way of learning the foundational knowledge. I'm just trying to look at it from the school board perspective, and and we need to see outcomes. Right. And and our current outcome goals that 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 we need that part of what we need to flesh out is are we on track with these and to allow lane to kind of fill them in in the best way that he can um are those the the that foundational knowledge critical thinking those ends goals that that were that are in our policies. So that's where I'm like, I don't know if the school board has a role in this part. Okay. It, it would be more um, maybe down in the foundational knowledge. I, I got it. Okay. Do, do you, I see what you're I, saying. Uh, this is Lisa. Um, I feel like part of how we know that students have what they need to adequately learn is through our assessment data and through our social emotional and discipline data um so so i do see the connection there but it may be a little more um it's not as clear a, a line from point a to point b as it might be in some other places I wonder if we could even just add that um, verbiage that you just shared, Lisa, of like the emotional data and some of that stuff to that piece of the metric to indicate that it's not just the academics, but like you talk about data could be how many kids are getting into trouble and having detentions, if that's still a thing, or, you know, how many kids are, yeah. are being put into these disciplinary. So maybe adding that part of that metric is, is that piece might help people to see that connection. Right. I feel like the evidence is like successful student performance. That's the evidence that shows that we're providing access to the resources, materials, and supports that they need, in my mind anyway. Say so that evidence is successful student achievement? Yeah, successful student performance, whether it's related to behavior or academics, um, that, that's the evidence that shows that we're, we're supporting them in the right ways. I think looking at um, EST data and um, SPED data too, because um, we have district-wide a high percentage of kids on plans. Um, and so I could see this as an area, 
like if we see those numbers starting to decline, then clearly we're providing what kids need within the general ed classroom. Okay, you said EST and what was the other data? Uh, EST and IEPs. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay. I think Is it's there like a general oh, data? Oh. Go ahead, Lindsay. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, um, I was I was just going to say as long as um, and um, I'm sure most people in the school would understand this, but when we're talking about data, we're a lot of these numbers we're using as a dipstick on the understanding that you know this is how we check the general condition, but you know if the oil smells funny, as it were, we're going to deep it, dive in and find the nuance and find out what's going on. So just because a student is achieving really really well, that doesn't mean we're going to ignore the little orange or red flags that pop up and dive in deeper when we need to. So it's not just blindly following the numbers and going, oh, they're going up, it's all good. It's it's deeper than that. Okay. It, it also seems like um, we're ensuring that they have access to learning resources and materials, but, and environment. I mean, they need to have a place where they can learn and that doesn't, I don't see that later on, so. And Anne, when you talk about needing data, like is this something where, and, and I don't know if this information's out there because um, I'm not in the education side as much, but like, is there a percentage that people use of like, okay, if for, for each of these things, for example, like for even the special ed, like if there's a certain amount that go down, is that generally in the education world considered successful? Or is there with your certain testing, if you're above a 60% or a 70% school-wide, like are there benchmark data there that then the school board could kind of utilize if they like me don't have this knowledge to be able to use that data to know that it was or wasn't successful? If that makes so sense. That's hopefully what the school board is asking the educated professionals to come up with is tell us what is give us. So we basically say achieve these results and then we want we want them to say okay you're we're going to use this way of assessing and here are the benchmarks that we're going to be looking at we're going to say 70 percent of the kids are going to be at this place and as a board the board doesn't have the expertise to outline that that we, we dump back to the educators to say okay we want kids to have foundational knowledge we want it in these areas. Um, now, you as educators define that for us. And then as long as it's a reasonable interpretation, then we take that data. And they, they have to provide that rationale. And we can go back and forth on the rationale, like, why did you come up with this? We can question it as a board so that we can understand it. But um, we're looking for but we need to have data to to um, show achievement toward ends. But um, our ends are very vague, and that's part of this outreach is to try and clarify them a little bit more with the public. And we we're also relying on stakeholders at having some staff here who are more familiar with sort of the way education works. I'm going to I'm going to take folks uh, if I can find it. I think it's right here. What Anne is taught. Oh, no, this isn't exactly the one. Um, I don't know if I can find it. Huh. I don't think this is it either. And I was uh, trying to find the uh, September 2020 ends report where there are percentages on uh students right uh, expectations and i'm not seeing it right here hmm. well i won't i won't spend more time looking but there is a document that uh, i have been looking at and i'll continue to look at as we move forward here so i think i've captured david uh, i want to come back to you david uh, roller you said something that I didn't capture here. Could you say that again? Uh, I hate when you ask me to use my memory. Um, so um, it was back up there where we've got, you've got to scroll for me back up where you were in the black stuff on the left. 
um, oh, over here. For, for, yeah, ensuring all students have access to learning resources, materials, and environment. You know, they've got to have a place to learn, not just stuff to learn with. Got it. That seems to fit with what we're asking in the rest of this part of the matrix. Got it. Thank you. Exactly right. That just supports this whole theme uh, title, the culture and the climate. Okay. All right. Other thoughts in school culture and climate? Again, I'll, I'll stick another, this up. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say another quick thought about if we're talking about culture and climate, and if some of this is like parent student and we want that data, I don't know if the school board would think like, is this for a yearly or bi yearly survey to parents and students about the climate of the school and how they're feeling about those things? Like, is that something else that could be helpful or a data that you could start having to track over the next two or three years to show our people, especially if we think there's some disconnect now, do we see that improving? So I, I just don't know if that's another possible measure that might be able to be used. Yeah, so I, I have that a little bit lower as something new, uh, but I, I just added create longitudinal data uh, tracking, I think, tracking and trends. And I've also suggested as a possible resource, uh, this Qualia Institute, they provide uh, templates for student uh, surveys, for parent surveys, and for teacher surveys on voice and aspirations. And again, that is something for administrators and the board to look at. I know that Lane has a student survey that he's been utilizing. This uh, could expand that to two other kind of stakeholder roles. And this is really dealing with uh, voice and aspirations. So this is another way to assess school culture, climate from teachers, students, and families' perspectives. And the elementary school already takes a, a PBIS survey that could maybe help with that as well. Okay. Got it. Positive behavioral intervention systems? Yes, yeah. Okay. Got it? All right. So what I've done is I've maybe gone a little too quickly here. We're transitioning from all the stuff that you just gave me that I'll clean up later. Uh, the, next act, uh, the next goal area is closing gaps for academic learning. And this is dealing not with foundational knowledge. This is more the social, emotional learning, gender, racial justice, and poverty. And to this point, align staff professional development programs to meet the goal. Is there anything else that would strengthen this from a, from a measurement metric standpoint? What I'm doing is I'm just kind of moving across here. And again, as I pose these questions, think about your survey compilation of data, think about your forum compilation of data, think about your own personal views as a member of the design team. Is this where you put in something about like um, having math labs and literacy labs and intervention blocks built into the daily schedule you know to be able to instead of like pulling kids out of a regular classroom you're giving them additional supports in the areas uh, that might have the the gaps absolutely absolutely math labs what was what the other lab literacy labs Okay, and you said something else as well, Kelsey? Um, I just said like interventions in general or accelerations. I don't know what is the better term, but. Okay, I like, I like the accelerations. That intervention tends to denote 
students that aren't doing as well need to catch up, but we also need to make sure that the, the kids that are doing quite well, how we continue to challenge them. All right, good. That's what I'm looking for. Well, Quentin, the, the goal here is closing gaps for academic learning. So would a metric just be simply test scores or is that too simple? No. Uh, we often call those student assessment scores. And help me, uh, educators, do you talk about uh, proficiency standards? What, 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 are the, what are the terms you use here? Well, I think the assessment is measuring proficiency, right? So, yeah. So that's OK. Well, I think you could take out assessment and and just student proficiency scores. Okay. Great. Thank you, David. Right on the money. I'm wondering then, do we need to go back to looking at the only thing is you said this was about like the social, emotional, learning, gender, racial stuff, not about the foundational knowledge. So I'm wondering if the closing gaps for academic learning isn't really the goal that we're looking to have right now, because it sounds like we're not talking about academic learning. We're talking about social, emotional learning um in terms of what you had so i'm just i'm just questioning or if we're, or if we're gonna end up duplicating with foundational I, knowledge i'm gonna i'm gonna put it down there you're exactly right okay all right so these are more about, about the structures and systems that support learning so I don't know if this belongs here or somewhere else, but I'm looking at this. I'm just thinking um, when I'm looking at that list, um, like closing the gaps and then the the part of it that says about social emotional learning, gender and so on. Um, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but having worked here now for four years, what I observe is probably the biggest driver in in creating gaps um, in our students is is poverty from what I can see. I mean, that seems to be the overwhelming theme I notice is students in poverty are the ones who really struggle academically. And I don't know if there is an action step or anywhere on this matrix where we can honestly address that. And is there anything we can do to support those families better uh, to help their kids access their education better? I think with what Richard is saying, like the poverty and then the trauma that many experience that are in poverty, that tends to be the biggest barrier that we encounter with kids and their ability to access their education. Okay. Is there any way in a metric that you could quantify like how many students are using like utilizing like our social workers and like some of those services that we offer maybe as a way to kind of metrically monitor that and again whether that goes down because it means us are needing it or just if it means we're effectively using those programs it would show that um, we're, we're attempting to manage that. I think our Swiss well data would be really helpful too. Let's say that again. I think our Swiss data would be really helpful. Yeah. I'm seeing some puzzled faces. Can you remind us what Swiss data stands for, please? Oh gosh, I don't remember exactly what it stands for. Maybe somebody else can help me, but it's essentially it, it comes it's a collection of data it's the database they use to collect the pbi pbis you know what the discipline referrals are what the things are found for as uh the students are being found for in terms of the good things they're doing as well yeah i got it right here it stands we for uh, school-wide information systems we do need to recognize though that the data over the last year uh, since COVID hit is massively skewed um, in the, uh, I mean, happily we've had a lot, I mean, I, I, maybe I, this is just me, but we've had uh, a lot fewer behavior interventions this year, just because the kids, it, the class has been smaller, the kids have been excited to be there. So we're going to see that creep back up, I'm sure, as we get back towards quote unquote normalcy. Um, but yeah, just being aware that the data of the last year is probably not reliable in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, so I wonder when, oh, these, if, oh sorry. Go ahead, I was just going to say about the, moving the additional supports with math and provide interventions. Are those more our action steps 
as opposed to the metric in which we're measuring it by, and then the yeah. assessing numbers of students and analyzing. Good idea. I was going to say something similar. I think what you just moved over and the one above it seem more like action steps to me. And some of these metrics are great, and I appreciate where they're coming from as far as they're good metrics to measure what the school is doing, which you need because you need action items. But I still get back to if you're trying to close the gap for academic learning, your overall strategy is around addressing these social emotional thing. But the, at the end of the day, the metric is, are, are they more proficient in, in test scoring better on tests? I still think that's the end goal that, that is a measure, but I guess that's, that's just my opinion. It's this, in, in this category, it's still important as to whether addressing these social emotional is, is helping or not, I guess. But at the end of the day, I still think it test scores matter. Can we change the wording of the goal if we have that essentially down lower in the foundation to maybe better go towards this being the, the goal, this particular goal being more about the social emotional? Because we have the academic part down in foundational knowledge, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, we do. But maybe maybe it goes in both areas. So I, for right now, I'm going to leave it here just so that I make sure uh, that it's addressed here because they both are working in, in synchrony. It's not foundational knowledge is here and and uh, the culture is in another place it's how they inter interface that's that's important and david i think you you hit that right on the head and i think sometimes what's missing when you just look at the test data is that you're missing the growth so sometimes it just shows how many people are achieving it's not showing those kids that have shown so much growth so they might not still be meeting that metric that we want them to, but gosh, they have been working with a social worker and have shown so much growth. So I think that's a piece that that's missing when we just look at test data. I agree. I think I'm thinking about kids on IEPs that can make tremendous growth and no longer need these significant um, levels of supports, but yet they may never be proficient. Um, however, they may have gone from a full-time one-on-one para to only needing support for 30 minutes once a day or something. And, and that's pretty significant. Okay. I'm gonna chime in as a, as a board member, it's that kind of benchmark and those kinds of outcomes that we're looking at is are we moving kids forward in that, in that way? Um, and I would agree I mean, again, I, I like having you here, David, because that's exact that outcome is really what we're looking for. We, we need outcomes. It's great to have all this stuff and and it's all important. But in the end, we need to have kind of a succinct where are, where are we now at these various benchmark points? And you can do it by grade level. You can do it, you know, according you know, we really should probably be doing it by grade level because we've we've got an entire system K-12. If if we're headed in the wrong way and we haven't checked until 11th grade to see where everybody's at or if we're hitting these benchmarks, then we're gonna we're we're not really um, able to correct the ship a little bit and steer in it in a slightly yeah. different way. And that's sort of uh, hopefully what we'll will have is kind of a, a set of benchmarks along the way that we can monitor and see how we're doing as a total system. Excellent point, Ian. Thank you. Um, David, I recognize what you're saying about the academic achievement and having the, uh, the test results be a metric. One thing we do want to be wary of, though, is you can have a group of kids who are getting fantastic test scores, but when you go and meet these kids, they may be emotionally wrecked and completely burnt out. So we do have to, we have to see that side of it as well um you might have kids who have fantastic test scores but that may not speak well to their mental health so it's it's really important to keep all those plates spinning yeah and i don't know off the top of my head a metric for that but it, it's certainly i agree with you it's not a proficiency test score but i, I think i like the metric oh, that that. i think what kayla brought up might be a good metric of you know maybe monitoring the number of ieps or who comes off of ieps or who's using less of an iep or less support that sounded like a good metric 
that I think I've heard Lane speak to in the past too about overall trying to address some of these um, behavioral things earlier in the elementary so that you're not seeing it later. And I feel like maybe he already tracks some of that. Okay. Yeah, part of the. It sounds like there's. Sorry about that. I was going to say part of the uh, trying to develop the end statements that were current with the board. Um, one of them did deal with IEPs. Um, we actually created a rubric. The team, um, special education team, did a really good job. Created a rubric to be able to kind of track over time. Um, you know what I call the severity of IEP, how intrusive it is on a student's regular learning environment um, as part of a tracking mechanism to make sure that we're accomplishing what we're supposed to with those students. So there, there's quite a bit of work that was done on that over the last couple of years. Just getting a okay. monitoring system set up. Got it. It sounds to me, and again, I'm not in the education, but that's where maybe it helps to kind of look for the school board. Like there's a lot of the data that's being tracked. It may just be that the school board needs access to like, these are the current information that we use and whether then you're looking at standard deviations of like we expect over the years that this is you know this is what typically can show proficiency or not it may just be helpful to to put out the information whether it's from the special ed stuff whether it's from the statewide stuff whether it's the iep so that they can see again what those numbers are what are sort of your average recommended numbers i mean i'm sure if there's that much data out there there must be some normalized data that you would be comparing to and then are ways that we can pick pick out this emotional stuff as we kind of need to as well, um, you know, through um, some of the, you know, more specific data, behavioral data and things like that. But it sounds like it's there. It's just that probably those of us that aren't in the school system kind of need access to what it is and how that information is being, you know, uh, evaluated. All right, I found the file that I couldn't find earlier. So here, here, here the here's the ends plan that Lane presents to the board. And this was in revised fall of 2020. This is so uh, the theme area is special education. Lane, do you want to decipher that a little bit? Can you see that okay? Yeah, so there was, uh, and again, I actually had a little bit of discussion on this earlier tonight. Um, when I started in the district, um, I took each of the ends, did an interpretation of it, it ended up being like this 30 page report, um, ends report um, that was, you know, tying in uh, the best data that I could interpret uh, based upon the research for each of the ends that the board said. The board did not seem to be happy with the amount of testing data that was there with standardized testing. So I was moving stuff around, manipulating, trying to figure out, you know, the target that they were wanting me to aim for. And so I just tried to create something very simple. Um, you know, it still relied on the test, the, the national, um, excuse me, the state testing data, but this is what I came up with during the last round before we went into COVID. <clears throat> okay. And I think there's four, four different kind of theme areas. This is English language arts. Yeah, and part of the discussion about this was, you know, the board has multiple areas for their current end statement. Um, part of the discussion in the report that went along with this was the idea that, hey, um, there are too many areas in there to work constructively on all of them at once um, based upon talking with the cabinet based upon the thinking is that these are the ones that are the most high profile for the district. Um, so these are the ones that we should work on first. Um, once we hit these initial goals, that 70% threshold that we're looking for, then, you know, we come back together, decide if we should be trying to push those a little bit higher or if it's time to move on to a different end, you know, once we're, we're, we're hitting those thresholds uh, consistently. Okay. And here's a good example of a uh, projected metric. Well, we're approaching the goal of gaining an additional 4.3% per year in the weighted average of all elementary students exceeding the proficiency threshold. So those are the kinds of, uh, I don't hard and fast, but uh, clear ends uh, metrics. And then this one is mathematics. So, uh, Go ahead. 
So when I just one of the lanes put a lot of effort and work into this and we've started and we're on this path. I'm hoping that as we come up with this new strategic plan, we don't, it's not like we dump this one. Correct. But we continue to monitor this and and maybe add some more in at as as this one is sort of working and and we're we're getting some data we're seeing some improvement maybe you know it may need to be tweaked here and there as they try some different things and they don't work and so you you try something new and and that's and that's fine um but yes, we. The, it is more helpful to have information presented in this format rather than a yep. big long data dump where board members who are lay people makes it really hard for us to understand. We ne it needs to be more succinct like this as as we move forward so, mm -hmm. um, from the board perspective. Anyway. Yeah, uh, I will. I will pull these together. This would all be under uh, foundational knowledge. And so I guess I, what I'm going to throw out to you all is, does it make sense to embed uh, the special ed, the uh, English language arts, the math and the science uh, to weave those into the foundational knowledge strategic plan? And then the strategic plan has some other uh, other priorities. But does that make sense to the design team? And I guess just with a thumbs up, uh, maybe David uh, Roller, you can uh, you can help me with this. Did we take a thumb vote? Yeah, I think you thumb. So we we've got support to mm -hmm. to, to merge those two together. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. great. All right. So we are still under culture and climate. Uh, have we finished? Take a look at the new. This will be under. I'm assuming it's still closing gap for academic learning. These are additional uh, action steps and metrics. You have suggestions here for language additions or edits. Maybe we finish that. I think the only thing is we don't have the actual metrics. Like who's gonna come up with those numbers to present it so it looks similar? Is that something somebody else does later? Or how does that, like when do we well, actually come up with the metric piece like Anne's look like they're yeah. looking for? Well, I think uh, I've uh, uh, previously had a meeting with Lane to go through some of this. And I'm going to meet with hopefully Lisa and David Roller uh, to continue to uh, do that. I'm I'm thinking that Anne and Lane, if I could have a meeting with the two of you uh, after I meet with David and Lisa, I think it makes sense that we could have this pretty well shaped up, and then if we can come back together as one more design team, uh, just to make sure that it's all coherent and understandable and it's deep jargon from education education east uh, that that probably makes some sense and we're getting a little shy on time tonight we've only made it through one of these uh, but you've given me some outstanding uh, feedback what are your thoughts do you want to put this on hold and let the uh, a couple of administrator teams take a cut at this and then come back and you all take a look at it, see what it looks like afterwards. Does that make sense to do it that way? Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of things. Let me just, uh, I want to share with you these two issues. Uh, I think, and again, this shows five theme areas. We're going to only have four. Um, does this look like a reasonable, I call it a macro timeline? Uh, what it's doing is it talks about stakeholder feedback, the theme identification, the beginning of creation of strategic plan. You'll have uh, four theme areas rather than five. 
And so they'll, they'll mirror the theme topics in this goal matrix. But what this is about is so that someone from the public or the board or administrators can take a look at this. And in 2023, under, uh, well, see these topics are different topics than what we're using, uh, culture and climate. In 2023, what are we going to be doing either starting or finishing in, in that year? Or in 2022, same thing. So we'll have little bubbles that will emerge in different places, but you can follow uh, in kind of one uh, high level macro view, know where you're going and um, be able to look at it that way. And then the other, uh, the other one is to have these theme areas uh, built into the goal matrix so that graphically, and again, these are different topics, but communication and relationship building is one that uh, is ours. So it might look like this. Uh, curriculum and career pathways, it shows music, it shows the world of work, military, uh, academic focus. Again, graphical depictions help to, to tell the story. And again, we'll change these graphics, but I just wanted to share this with you and get your uh, feedback on, uh, does this seem to be a good way to go? Uh, thoughts or issues? Any feedback for me? Are people supportive of that? You need more, que you have more questions? Help me to know because I'm, uh, I've, uh, through Tina Scheindel, we've got a graphic arts teacher at the tech center that's willing to mock up um, both the timeline as well as the, the icons, but I don't want him to do that volunteer work if, if you're not supportive of that's a direction to go in. I mean, at first glance, I feel like the first um, visual uh, shows a lot more information than the than the little icons do. All right. Well, imagine that the little icons will be in one of these bubbles. So as they come out of the strategic plan, uh, you'll have a little uh, you'll have four little icons here, and you'll also see them. Where are we here? where it says communication and relationship building, you'll have the little icons here. So you've got, you've got the narrative, but you've also got the, the, graphical, uh, the graphical icon that also tells you the story of communication and relationship building. And so that's, that's um, many strategic plans have these kinds of uh, graphics built into them. I think anything that improves accessibility for people would be a good thing. Um, I don't see that as a, uh, uh, I, I think it's a good idea. Okay. And um, what I hear you time. saying is not one or the other is a combo of both? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just tells the story. Some people learn, uh, have different learning styles and some see the, see the, the message in graphics and others see them in narrative. And so it's, it's like our learning styles. Uh, Gardner has seven or nine different learning styles because some students learn better um, through art and through science, and some lose better through uh, kin uh, kinesthetic movement. So it's the same kind of thing here. All right. So I'm feeling like we are going to have to uh, schedule another meeting, but there's going to have to be some work with administrators in between. Uh, I don't think that I, I can do anything until after the board meeting on the 10th. So what, what we present on the 10th will be a draft. It won't be the final. And I could meet uh, either on the 12th with you. Uh, I start to get wide open on the week of the 17th. So oh, it won't be on the 19th. I have a... Uh, I have a date with my bride. Um, so what, what's a good date? 
Are you feeling like the week of the 17th makes sense or it's we're getting into the crazy zone and we'd be better to uh, have a, a meeting on the, say the 12th? I wonder about sticking to Mondays and meeting on the 17th. Okay. All right, let's uh, look at the 17th. Let me, let me see uh, what folks think, think about Monday the 17th. How does that work for you all? Monday the 17th? Ah, good, beautiful. Okay, then let's do it that way. So 6.30 to eight, is that still a good time for you? Got it. All right, I will invite you to that. And I'll be coming to you from the Smoky Mountains. And uh, we talked about Appalachia before. It's not exactly there, but it's certainly in the Appalachian uh, range. And uh, we have to crank up the internet, and crank it really fast so you can get enough bandwidth to communicate uh, up north. But I'm sure we can make it happen. Uh, so with that, I think we got through uh, pretty much everything. What I'll do is uh, schedule offline with, with David, and, with David Roller and uh, with Lisa, and schedule offline with Ann and Lane. And uh, stay tuned, I'll continue to kind of present to you the updates and we'll, we'll finalize on the 17th. Uh, Lane and Ann, then the board must meet again uh, one time in June. Uh, what's do you have a date of that uh, June meeting? It's the second Monday in June, whatever. Yeah, four, 14th, I believe. Uh, well, the second, second month, oh, sec, is it the 14th? Okay, all right, and that's a 6 30 board meeting. Yes, all right, so save that in your calendars because I would love to have you uh, kind of observe the handoff. To the, uh, to the school board on the 14th. And with that, uh, I thank you very, very much. Have a great rest of the evening and excellent work tonight. Thanks a lot, gang. See you later.